Have you ever discovered a hidden secret locked within a larger puzzle? A riddle within a riddle? My name is Ruth Dwyer, and that's what happened when I was looking very closely at the Church of the Hagia Sophia, built by the Emperor Justinian in Constantinople. I am an art historian. All observations, research, and conclusions are my own. Armed with a floor plan, measuring tape, and a camera, wonderful discoveries were made. This is a story that reveals unrecognized and profound links between the Hagia Sophia, or the Hagia Sophia, which the Byzantine Emperor Justinian named the Church of Holy Wisdom, the 6th century philosopher Boethius, and his translations known as the Quadrivium. The Church, the philosopher, and his translations are all linked to the Byzantine concept of wisdom. We will begin with the building, which was completed by Justinian in the year 537 in Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. For almost a thousand years, it was regarded as one of the largest buildings in the world. It has been documented that, during construction, Justinian spent a great deal of time attending to every detail of the design and construction of the building. He even had his own kiosk on site. He was known as the emperor who never sleeps. It is very important at this stage to mention that Justinian spoke Latin. It was his mother tongue. Therefore, for him to be fully in charge, he would require all of the relevant documents to be in Latin. Boethius, in his Consolation of Philosophy, converses with Lady Philosophy. Her dress is embroidered with symbols arranged in the shape of a ladder, representing the Byzantine levels of learning which must be completed in order to achieve wisdom. The letter pi, not to be mistaken for the mathematical pi, 3.14, is at the hem of her dress at the bottom of the ladder. Theta is at the top and there are rungs, or steps of learning in between. The pi represents the trivium, the foundation of learning, reading, writing, and rhetoric. Boethius coined the term quadrivium to describe the next level of learning, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. The quadrivium must be completed before moving on to the study of philosophy and theology, which, when mastered, brought one to the ultimate wisdom, Theta. For Justinian to give the Church the name of Holy Wisdom, the building would need to reflect that which was considered to be particularly wise. Therefore, the most scholarly documents in arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy would be needed for the design. As well, since Justinian took such an intense interest in the building process, he would need these documents in his mother tongue, Latin. According to the 6th century historian Cassiodorus, Boethius made Latin translations of Euclid, Ptolemy, and Nicomachus of Gerasa. Two of them, Arithmetic and Music by Nicomachus, are extant. But the other two, Euclid's Elements and Ptolemy's Almagest, are in question. Did Boethius translate them? The Church of Holy Wisdom will help to resolve this question. In my previous work, I have proven that the building is based on Pythagorean principles, and we know that Boethius, Euclid, Ptolemy, and Nicomachus were all Pythagoreans. We are going to look at the Church of Holy Wisdom and examine the role of Theta and the Quadrivium. We will begin with Theta, the symbol for the highest wisdom. Is the symbol for Theta found in the Hagia Sophia? Yes, it is. Fascinatingly, the image for Theta which Justinian and his scholars chose was the ancient symbol, a circle with a cross. This symbol was current when Pythagoras was teaching. It is found all over the building, in carved marble decorations and in mosaics. It is so prevalent that it suggests the building was designed with the highest level of learning in mind, requiring all to look upward and contributing toward the concept of a building worthy of its name, the Church of Holy Wisdom. When Justinian entered his church, he saw Thetas on each side of him, above the capitals and above the monograms, in mosaics and carved into marble. What do all of these Thetas symbols tell us? that Justinian aligned himself with the highest form 
of wisdom. In my previous work, Pythagoras and the Hagia Sophia, I demonstrated that the design of the building was based on the ancient Greek concept of symmetria, the balance and harmony of every element and measure joined together by one basic unit, which unites everything. In the Hagia Sophia, the basic unit is the imperial monogram. Pythagoreans believed that everything is made meaningful with number, that the number six represents perfection and ten represents God or the divine. In this building, we will see many examples of sixes and tens, including a remarkable 610-16 number progression. When Justinian walked down the nave, he was on a compass heading which is Nicomachus and Euclid's own proof of the perfection of the number six. The compass heading is exactly 123.6 degrees. According to Pythagoras, via Nicomachus and Euclid, the numbers 1, 2, and 3, whether added or multiplied, result in the same number, 6. On the imperial wall there are 16 circles. The railing which separated Theodora from the main nave has 6 panels consisting of 16 of these geometric shapes known as quatrefoils. Also on the imperial wall, the height of the emperor's door was 6 times 6 times the diameter of the monogram. Theodora stood in the Queen's Gallery overlooking the nave. Behind her is a bordered area consisting of 16 white marble slabs. In the Queen's Gallery, the Empress herself stood on a disc which measured 6 times the diameter of the imperial monogram. When multiplied by 60, it equals the diameter of the excedrae, and when Justinian walked from his imperial entrance, to the end of the nave, the distance was 6 times 60, the diameter of his monogram. When Justinian walked down the aisle of his church, what did he see? He saw six groups of six columns on the second floor, six aisle divisions in the nave, and many other sixes. He saw 16 great columns in the nave, and many other sixteens. The green, purple, and white original 6th century marble columns in the building have their own extraordinary 610-16 number progression story to tell. And there are marvelous patterns to their distribution, which are visual and mathematical. Let us investigate these patterns in the floor plan. Green dots represent the green marble columns, purple dots represent the purple columns, and white dots for the white. The main floor is on the left, with the blue arrow indicating the entrance, and the second floor is on the right. When Justinian entered his church, he saw 16 great columns downstairs lining the nave, and six groups of six columns upstairs, each of them with the imperial monogram. When he stood in the center under the dome, he saw only sixes and sixteens. He saw 16 green columns, even though there were more of them. The other green columns on the main floor, indicated by orange arrows, were hidden from his view because they were located behind large piers. These hidden columns seem to have only one purpose, to make the overall numbers auspicious. How does this work? Because the green columns on the second floor are all visible from the main floor, and they are arranged into six groups of six columns each. So, he saw only sixes and sixteens. The total number of green columns on both floors is 60. There are no purple columns on the second floor. These are only in the excedrae or corners of the main floor. Imperial monograms exist only on purple and green columns. There are no monograms on the white. These white non-monogram columns are organized into six groups upstairs and four groups on the main floor for a total of ten groups. Again, their numbers are significant. There are 60 columns upstairs and 40 downstairs for a total of 100 original columns. The 610 number progression does not stop here. In the corners, the excedrae, the numbers are also important. On the main floor there are 6 columns and on the upper floor there are 10, for a total of 16 in each corner. This pattern of columns and imperial monograms and their arrangement is startling in its sophistication and reveals a design plan that is remarkable for its symmetry 
and use of the 61016 number progression. Let us continue with the importance of the number 6 and apply a six-sided geometric shape to the Hagia Sophia, a hexagon. When we apply this to the main floor, we discover something most interesting. Amazingly, all columns with monograms, the green and purple, fit inside the hexagon, and all white, non-monogrammed columns are located outside of this six-sided shape. It is interesting that only the most important columns, those associated with Justinian and Theodora, would be embraced by this hexagon. It is also no accident that one of the axes of the hexagon would be the 123.6 degree heading upon which Justinian walked. When entering the Hagia Sophia, one sees the great doors along the imperial wall. They have very distinctive circles on them, with a point in the center, making them quite different from the other circles in the building. It was time to investigate this phenomenon. The answer was found in Euclid's Elements in Book 1, Definition 15, where the circle is defined as having a point at its center. This is known as the monad. Do we have other examples of the monad in the Hagia Sophia? Yes, we do. The upper railing and the railing around the dome, which wrap around the church, are made up of hundreds of wooden panels which have the circle with the central point as its central motif. These monads are the same diameter as the imperial monogram. On the opposite page to the monad in Euclid's Elements, we see two circles intertwined with a triangle, an illustration of Book 1, Proposition 1, a method for constructing equilateral triangles. The marble inlay in the floor in the Queen's Gallery strongly suggests Euclid's Book 1, Proposition 1. When two circles are overlapped so that the second circle's perimeter meets the center point of circle 1, the overlap area is known as the vesica piscis. The center points of the vesica piscis, when connected, will always create an equilateral triangle. The queen's floor is not a perfect representation. The equilateral triangles are outside the vesica piscis. Nevertheless, there are interesting similarities. Another important geometric shape on the imperial wall is the rectangle. There are a number of them, and some of them have a proportion of 1 to 1.6. What we know is the golden ratio appeared in Euclid's Elements Book 2, Proposition 11, and Book 6, Proposition 40. Let's examine the rectangles on the imperial wall. I have shaded the wall a blue color so that we may see our rectangles more easily. From the top of the monad railing to the bottom of the doors, we see that the proportions of the golden rectangle fit exactly. The emperor's doorway, the side doorways, the queen's gallery, and the panels around the imperial door, each is a golden rectangle. There are ten golden rectangles on this wall. Upstairs in the queen's gallery, a golden rectangle separates her sight from the nave below. And on the inside is a second golden rectangle. What is remarkable is not only do we see the golden ratio on the imperial wall, we can also discover its proof according to Euclid's Book 4, Proposition 11. The segments of the line AB are the proportions of the golden ratio. This star shape, a pentagram with the point at the bottom, was the logo or symbol of Pythagoreans. When we look at it as an overlay over the imperial wall, we see that it is a perfect fit. All of the important intersections of the pentagram align with important locations on the imperial wall, as does the large pentagon. The inner pentagon embraces perfectly the empress and the marble motifs above the imperial doorway. These motifs will be discussed in a future presentation. The side aisles of the building have geometric forms in fact, 16 of them. These circles, rectangles, and ellipticals are located inside the shaded area of the floor plan on each side of the nave. When we look up, we see something most remarkable, many, many semicircles, from the hemidomes and excedrae to the semicircular shapes of every single archway. It is interesting to recall that Pythagoras' group was known as the semicircle. 
when we look up, we also see the large dome. We know from the research of two musicologists, Dr. Neil Morin of Toronto and Shebnam Yevas of Istanbul, that there were singers in the rim of the dome. I owe them both a great deal of thanks for their invaluable help. Ms. Yevas accompanied me into the dome and has been very generous with the results of her work. Boethius in De Musica classified music into three categories consisting of Musica humana, the music of human voice and spirit, Musica instrumentalis, or instrumental music, and Musica mundana, the music of the planets. How did Justinian apply these categories to the Hagia Sophia? Let us begin with Musica humana. Justinian himself wrote hymns and dictated that they would be sung in all churches. This particular church was not only going to be the largest church in the world, it was also being dedicated to holy wisdom. It is thus logical to assume that the best possible acoustic space would be designed for his singers and musicians. It has always been a marvel that the interior space of the Hagia Sophia is so open, and that the dome seems to be suspended in air. Wonderfully, musicians could be located on any of four levels, within the dome, on the upper gallery, on the lower gallery, and at the floor level. At each of the upper levels, the rim of the dome, the upper gallery, and the lower gallery, there are ancient metal arms attached to the railings, which held the oil lamps by which musicians and singers could see their music, and which would also provide a ring of light around the base of the dome, and further lighting along the galleries at night. And, at each of these upper locations, we can see from my photographs taken during my trip to the Hagia Sophia in October 2012, that the musicians and singers would be obliged to stand very near the wall. It would also be necessary for them to stand side by side. It would not be possible to cluster musicians in a group, except on the ground floor, where they were located on the ambo, a platform on which priests and singers stood. It was extremely unusual then, as it is now, to find singers located around the rim of a dome. Similarly, it was unusual then and extremely rare now to have singers located at different levels standing very closely to a wall. Is there a reason for this unusual situation? Yes, there is. According to Dr. Manu Mong of McMaster University, if singers are located next to a wall, the sounds of their voices will hug the walls and be conducted upward and downward, manipulating the direction of their voices. And interestingly, when I was in the dome with musicologist Shebnam Yavuz, her voice was heard clearly by the people on the ground floor. What this means is that a soloist in the dome would have been easily heard, and this means that the acoustics of the building were well understood when the design was established. And what is equally remarkable is that the acoustics still work, in spite of the fact that the dome has fallen and been reconstructed a number of times over the centuries. Shebnam Yavuz also demonstrated to me in October of 2012 that the arched walkways located on both floors also control and manipulate sound. Her acoustical research demonstrates that as musicians enter these walkways and move either toward the nave or away from the nave, there are alterations in the quality, magnification, and echo of certain tones. Musical sounds seem to expand or contract, depending on location. Her research indicates that many corners and areas of the building were designed with sound manipulation in mind. As we have seen with the walls, the dome, and the tunnel-like archways, these manipulations in such a large space would have been extraordinary to experience, particularly because of Justinian's own intense personal involvement in the design of the building and the composition of music. And not only was the sound manipulated and maximized, it was organized according to the Pythagorean perfect number six. Sound arrived from six areas, the dome, two upper galleries, two lower galleries, and the ambo. Not only did Justinian have a personal interest in the human voice, he was also taken with the musical instrument, the lyre. 
In this most interesting coin, minted while Justinian co-ruled with his uncle Justin, they share a lyre-backed throne. Pythagoras believed that the lyre's music was beautiful, healing, and the most perfect kind of instrumental music. Prominent Pythagorean authors Nicomachus, Euclid, and Ptolemy each wrote about the lyre. Boethius himself played the lyre and was considered an expert regarding the lyre and lyre musicians. Given that Justinian composed music for his church, and that each of the Pythagorean authors mentioned so far had an interest in the lyre, it is probable that Justinian played the lyre as well, if only to accompany himself as he composed. Pythagoras discussed the lyre with respect to the music of the spheres. Nicomachus in his harmonics compares the musical scale to the movements of the planets. Slowly moving planets, such as Saturn, produce low notes, while faster moving planets, such as Mercury, produce the higher notes. According to Nicomachus, the moon produced the highest note. The music of the spheres was celestial, and this musical celestial link to the stars is found at the imperial entrance. Using modern technology, Google Earth and Google Sky, it is possible to demonstrate that Justinian, when he was standing in his imperial entrance, was at an earthly geographical spot that had mathematical pi in its latitudinal coordinates. As explained in my first presentation, it is intriguing that near the imperial entrance there are large doors with arrows pointing toward the sky. Is there a reason we should look upwards? Yes, there is. Four centuries before Justinian built the Hagia Sophia, Lyra was listed as one of 48 constellations as described by Ptolemy in books 7 and 8 in his famous Almagest. The stars of these constellations were described with celestial, latitudinal, and longitudinal coordinates, and we see Vega, the brightest star in Lyra, with pi in its latitude. Ptolemy determined in the Almagest that pi equaled 3 and 17 over 120, or 3.1416. This exact number, 3.1416, is to be found not only in the latitudinal coordinates of Justinian's imperial entrance on Earth, but also in the sky, in Vega's celestial latitudinal coordinates. This is a very interesting connection to discover. Aside from the link to Lyra, Justinian clearly found astronomy important. In the most famous portrait of Justinian, he is shown wearing a cloak with a clasp in the shape of a sun. And all of his gold coins have a star on them. Much of what we have seen so far in the Hagia Sophia relates to number theory and to pattern. In the Almagest, Ptolemy was obsessed with numbers and patterns in his efforts to predict such things as lunar and solar eclipses. He devised many charts based on historical information regarding the motions of the planets, the sun and moon, the stars, and eclipses. At the Hagia Sophia, there are two marble discs that strongly resemble solar eclipses. One is located on the imperial wall to the left of the emperor's entrance from the narthex, and the other is located in the north aisle on the first pier. In both cases, the disc of marble is in one piece, obviously chosen specifically for these locations. Were there any eclipses during the building of the Hagia Sophia? Yes, there were. Again, we turn to modern technology. NASA's website informs us not only that Ptolemy accurately predicted lunar and solar eclipses, but also that there were two total solar eclipses during the construction of the Hagia Sophia. The diagrams provided by NASA indicate the path and visibility of each eclipse. The yellow shaded areas show us that they were visible over Constantinople and indeed Justinian's entire empire, one occurring in 534 and the other in 536. Coincidentally, my presentation and video, The Comet of 536 in the Ravenna Mosaics, discusses the Earth's close encounter with a comet, the same year as the second eclipse, a very interesting year celestially for Justinian. The two marble discs just mentioned 
show an eclipse as it is occurring, with the sun partially obscured. Are there marble decorations which show the total eclipse? Yes, there are. They are above the excedrae, and they each consist of a round disc, a white ring of sun, with flames surrounding the ring. It is interesting to note that both eclipses listed are annular, meaning that there is a white ring of sun surrounding the disc of the moon, just like the marble discs over the excedrae. It appears, from the evidence on the walls and at the imperial entrance of the Hagia Sophia, that Justinian had access to Ptolemy's documents. We know that Ptolemy could predict eclipses. The implication was that Justinian had the wisdom to predict them as well. This would be a very powerful tool for an emperor to have, over his empire and beyond. The building itself connected the most powerful emperor on earth with the cosmos. So, with a highly complex design scheme, Justinian built the Hagia Sophia, which demonstrated a culmination of the highest wisdom, arithmetically with its intricate placement and quantity of perfect and auspicious numbers, geometrically with significant shapes both visible and invisible, musically by channeling and projecting the voices and instruments within the magical space of the interior, and astronomically by connecting the building to the stars and symbolizing the ability to predict future eclipses. The Church of Holy Wisdom was the biggest and the best. Boethius's Latin translations meant that Justinian could immerse himself in the entire design process, facilitating his own alignment with Theta. It has long been debated that Boethius's missing texts of the Quadrivium were Euclid's Elements and Ptolemy's Almagest. After seeing the stunning correlation between the design of the Hagia Sophia and the Boethian texts of De Arithmetica and De Musica, and Justinian's personal involvement with the construction of the Hagia Sophia following the Quadrivium, it is tempting to argue that Boethius' missing texts to complete the Quadrivium included these two works. We see examples of them everywhere. What conclusions can we reach? With his attempts to achieve Theta, Justinian demonstrated his power to rule over his empire, and he immortalized it in the walls, on the pillars, and in the spaces of his architectural masterpiece. He created the intellectually most perfect building in the world, which is just now revealing her secrets. Is it any wonder that the quadrivium is still visible in this Church of Holy Wisdom? And is it any wonder that the numbers, the spaces, and the geometries continue to cause awe and astonishment?